That was the shortest sermon I've ever preached. We're going to go on to the song. Excellent. So, this evening, we're um, going to look uh, at a particular word that um, we as Christians, um, that's in Scripture, and is a practice that is uh, called out for us, but we don't like, if we're honest. Uh, and it's one of those God moments, because I've, uh, I've offered this word uh, this morning at the church plant uh, in Oldham that I helped to, uh, to set up. And um, I think from what I hear that there was a particular word given at church this morning. And, and it sort of, this message goes on from, I think, what from Pastor Andy shared uh, as well as this word. And so we're going to have a look at that nasty little thing and challenging thing of repentance tonight. So let me just set the scene for you. I'm going to take you to Acts chapter 3, the beginning thereof. But uh, if, you're, if you've got your paper Bibles or on your phones or whatever, while you're finding that, let me just set the scene for you. In Acts chapter 2, Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit, has stood up and given his first full-blown sermon. And, and the response was, was quite amazing. Because the crowds that had been gathered there said, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so now let me just begin to read for you from the beginning of chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money, and Peter looked straight at him, and, and as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? If by your own power or godliness we had made this man walk, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he would foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Amen. There is a story I've heard about a little church 
that was struggling to get a minister. They had gone for year after year, desperately searching, putting adverts out, trying to twist arms and get people to come and consider being the minister for this church, but all to no avail. Then, one day, they got a minister and his wife who wanted who were considering perhaps coming and being their pastors. And so they were all excited. And what do we do? This is amazing. And then they had a bit of, bit of a meeting with the stewards. And they thought, we've got to put on the best show that we can. And they looked at the church building, and they thought it looked a bit drab and worn. So they thought, right, we'll paint it. Just get it freshened up, and it'll be wonderful. And some kind, some property steward, as wonderful as property stewards are, had worked out they needed 110 litres to paint the church building. But then the treasurer stood up and reminded them that they could only afford 80. So then another bright spark, and you always get bright sparks in church meetings, suggested that they could water the paint down and everything would be fine. So that's what they did. They watered the paint down. Painted the church building. Then came the day for the pastor and his wife, for the prospective pastor, to come and visit. And as is the way in Garstang, you won't be surprised what happened in this story. It rained. And they were just stood there outside watching their beautiful paintwork run and run and run. And they didn't know where to put themselves. And the pastor and his wife drove up and Saw this, got out of the car, and they were trying to make excuses. Whatever They showed them around the building. The pastor never said a word. Uh, and they showed him around the worship area, and he never said a word. Showed him around the fellowship rooms, and he never said a word. And then, finally, the stewards cornered him in the vestry and said, please, please, tell us what you think. And so the minister just looked at them with a stern look and said, Repaint and thin no more. <laughs> you can see why I'm a minister, not a stand-up comedian. But you try and find a jokey story about repentance. They're really hard to find. But repentance is really, really important. In fact, I'll go so far to say that it's crucial. If you go and look through the New Testament, well over 100 times, you can find the word repent or repentance or return used. It is central to our journey of faith with Jesus Christ. But it is seldom, seldom used in our day, and it's hardly a word used in wider society. And dare I say it in some churches that I've been in, that it's hardly used even within church itself. Probably because the culture has been obsessed with positive phrases and words and goals. You don't have to go too far on social media to get phrases like this. That if you can dream it, you can be it. If you're true to yourself, this is a classic one, this is, God will follow you. Or then happiness begins and ends with you. We're obsessed in the wider society with happy thoughts. There is no suffering and there is no sorrow. But the reality is that many of us are not experiencing the life and the relationship with God that he wants for us because we're unwilling to live out the attitude and reality of repentance. But before we go into what is repentance, let's just be very, very clear about what repentance is not. It is not God wanting to make you feel like a failure. You know, it, it's not that we sort of somehow have to live with some self-loathing or some sort of depressive attitude or constantly beat ourselves up somehow to feel spiritual. That's not repentance at all. But let's just go back and have a look at Acts chapter 3. So Peter and John are going to the temple to pray, and they go via the beautiful gate, and there is that lame beggar since birth, and they walk past, and he begs, and he, and he says, look, I don't have any money, but what I do, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. 
and instantly he's healed and he jumps to his feet. And could you imagine the scene? Running around, woo Praising and jumping and shouting and all the people are filled with awe and wonder. And then the man starts to hold on to, to Peter and the people come rushing to them in Solomon's colonnade, which was a big part of the temple, open plan with this colonnade. And Peter recognizes them because they were the same people that days and weeks before had done the most wicked thing. And Peter could have been filled with vengeance and hatred and bile. Peter tells them what they've done. They'd asked for a murderer to be freed instead of the Messiah, the Son of God himself. And as a result, he'd been tortured and he'd been crucified. They'd set a criminal free instead of freeing and giving life to the very prince of life. Peter looked at that mob and saw their sin. And so let's be very, very clear. All these years later, we are part of that same mob. They sent Jesus to the cross. We sent Jesus to the cross for our sins. But instead of going further, he says one of the most compassionate things, and maybe it's God's message for many of us today. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, when he could have ripped them to pieces, he could... uh, He says this, Repent then, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In the light of what they've done, and in the light of what we've done in our lives, we need to repent. So our sins can be wiped out. So we can have those beautiful times of refreshing, uh, that come from the presence of God himself. Now, I'm going to labor the point that maybe many of us here tonight, many of us in this church, are tired and weary and bitter and wound up, and we need a fresh wind of God through our individual and collective lives. And the only way we're going to get that, the only way, Scripture tells us, is repentance. So what is repentance? You know, you might have heard the odd sermon or two, or devotional, that it's just about, oh, just turn around and go in the opposite direction. But Scripture tells us it's even more important than that. It says it's to feel remorse and self-reproach for one's sins against God and to be contrite and sorry and to want to change direction. You see, sometimes we hear those sermons as I say, that we just, oh, just turn around. Just, yeah, just go the other way. But that definition, the crucial word, is want. True repentance includes a desire to change. So let me just briefly remind you of two things that repentance is. First of all, repentance is a changed mind. Let me take you to Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And they were incredibly messed up. A bit like us, but even more so, they were messed up. And Paul had taught them the truth of Christ, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and that they should go on mission and take this good news to the whole of the world. But somewhere, because of the culture that they still held on to, the social standards, they were messing things up big time. There were wrong teaching, there were wrong practices, and they were getting so, so far away from God. And he says, look at what you've been doing. Look at what you are still doing. And then in the second letter, in chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, he says this. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. 
For you became sorrowful as God intended, so you were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance, and that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Sorrow and being sorrowful has an impact. The question is, which type of sorrow are we going to participate in? Godly sorrow leads to repentance, to salvation. Worldly sorrow, let's put it bluntly, brings death. Which do you experience? Godly sorrow? doing something inside of you, or worldly sorrow, which is slowly killing you from the inside out. The fruits are very radically different. Too many of us, too many of us, in the church corporately, are into worldly sorrow. You know, where we view things from our own perspective. We see the consequences of our sin, maybe as a bit of an annoyance. We feel bad and we feel sorry, probably for the inconvenience. And we probably say in our prayers, God, just take it away from me. I don't want to struggle with it anymore. And, and if we're honest, we probably get a bit knocked and a bit frustrated and a bit irritated when God doesn't take it away. But if you view it through godly sorrow, you begin to see it from his perspective, through his eyes. And you see those things which veil our intimacy from him and with our heavenly father. The Greek word that's used for repentance is metanoia, which is a change of mind that leads to a changed behavior. So let's just get really personal how do you view your sins worldly sorrow irritated and frustrated but that's leading to death or do you see it through godly sorrow through God's eyes and brings repentance and life you see God wants to change your mind and see the things as they really are. There's that passage in Romans 12. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how do we do it? Only God can do it. You know, one of my favorite worship songs, Hosanna, which we're going to sing immediately after I, I finish talking, has a lyric that has become a prayer to me, and I would recommend it wholeheartedly to you. The line says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Break my heart for what breaks yours. It is the most dangerous prayer that you could ever, ever pray. But it is the most courageous one. That you could do because you're inviting the Holy Spirit to bring His convicting grace into your life and your heart to remove the scales from your eyes of your heart. But are you ready to pray that prayer for God to convict you and to change your mind? Or are you willing to just carry on experiencing godly sorrow? Oh, sorry, worldly sorrow. The second thing that it leads on to, repentance is a changed direction. Let me take you back into the Old Testament to Ezekiel. Uh, and God gives him a message to share with his people. In chapter 14, 6, it records, this is God talking to him. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Repent, turn from your idols and renounce your detestable practices. So repentance is not just a change of mind, but it's got to result in a change of action, a change of behavior, not just one-offs. Oh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll be good this time. I'll, I'll do something good. But one that changes your tra trajectory in your whole life. A divinely changed mind will always result in, in a change of direction. 
if God break, truly breaks our heart with what breaks his, it's got to result in action and change. If it doesn't, well, it's a sure sign we're actually sticking with godly, sorry, worldly sorrow. But that word, Greek word metanoia is a military word that was used on the parade ground by Roman soldiers sometimes. And they'd march in formation and the centurion would shout. It's like the equivalent of about turn or about face. He would shout metanoia, and the whole company would turn 108 degrees, 180 degrees, and never look back and start marching the other way. Perhaps in so many different ways we need to repent, to change our minds, change our directions, and never look back. So where are you going? Are you heading to the lower things? Or are you going for the higher things of life? That changed mind leads to changed behavior. But what does it look like in your life and your faith and our church? Now, I will be so bold to say that every one of us has at least one thing we need to repent of and go the opposite direction to. If you haven't, speak to me afterwards. And I might just in love call you a fibber. Because the scripture says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And if you're anything like me, I'm well above 50 and counting. And that's just from today. But maybe we're struggling with our thoughts in life. You know, watching the wrong things, listening to the wrong things. We're indulging in things. Maybe in terms of our thoughts or our words, we are becoming hypercritical and bitter and in getting involved in gossip and running people down behind their backs. Maybe it's our actions that are not living up to our faith. And maybe it's our faith In total, maybe it has just become dry and crusty and hard and religious. Maybe we just need to confess our sins, that we're just not living as God intended, and push worldly sorrow to one side. Stop trying to manage it and struggle it, and stop dying inside. Radical obedience is repentance. That convicted mind turns to instant action and change. Let me take you to the end of Scripture. Revelation chapter 2, which I think Pastor Andy talked about a little bit this morning. God's speaking through John to the churches, and he has this message for the church in Ephesus. And he says, but this I have against you, that you've left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you've fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. But then if you read on, there's a horror, there's a warning. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Remember from where you've fallen. Remember from where you've fallen and repent. Go back to the deeds and the love that you had at first. He says, this is what I've got against you, actually. It's not that you stopped doing these things and I need you to do other things instead. But God's saying through that verse, Look, you left me. You left your first love for that. And that brings me to the third point. What it's all about, repentance. Change of mind and a change of direction. That new trajectory when God breaks our heart with what breaks his. It's the third point and it's the third outcome of it all 
that repentance restores relationships. Because it's all about relationships. The cross was all about our relationship with God. And if we're honest, we've left our first love. And in Luke chapter 15, many of you will know the story of the prodigal son. But let me just delve back into it. The father and son relationship is perhaps at the heart of it. I know commentaries will say that it's more about the older brother and his grumpiness, but it's a multi-dimensional story that Jesus tells. But it encompasses all we've been looking at. And I pray that we'll put ourselves maybe just for those moments into that story that Jesus told. So the son comes to the father uh, and says and demands his inheritance uh, and sort of wants, you know, it's, it's, he's basically saying, look, I don't care. You're as good as dead to me. I just need your dosh. Come on, just give it over. So he goes and takes it uh, and feels entitled to it. He feels like life owes him something and maybe we feel we're entitled to things as well. But the father gives it to him, and his son goes on that road to destruction of wild living, wild friends, wild women, wild parties, you name it. And eventually, you know the story, the money, money runs out. The friends go, the money goes, the girls go, and he ends up doing the most, probably for a Jew, the most disgusting job, feeding pigs in a pig pen, hungry and dirty and being a slave. And the Bible records, Jesus says, when he came to his senses, he had a change of mind. He came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here am I starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. He came to his senses, a change of mind. He got up and went back to his father, a change, an utterly, totally change of direction. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and the sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So they changed his mind. He did something. He came to his senses. Just imagine, maybe, if that was a real situation what he was thinking about when he was going home. Whether he'd even sort of, you know, the shame and the guilt of it going home. But he still went. Maybe some of us are living that way, like he was. When he was breaking his father's heart, we're breaking God's heart. And we haven't done anything about it yet. Can you imagine if that story was real? The rehearsal going on through his mind on his way home. What's his father going to say? What's he going to do? Perhaps he's going to be just written off and cast out and not even accepted. Why wouldn't he? You know, many of us are parents. When the children are doing something wrong and we say, go to your room. Leave my presence. I can't even look at you now. That's maybe what the father could have said and what he was expecting because he'd sinned so badly. But our God is bigger than we are. His ways are higher than ours. So as the son went home, that's the amazing part of the story that we all know, that while he was far off, his father saw him. The father had been watching for him on that horizon day after day. Maybe he's been there thinking, could it be today, could it be today that I'll see my son again walk over that horizon? And when he saw him, things changed. When God sees you saying, I'm done, I surrender, break my heart with what breaks yours, God will do to you what 
he did to his son in this story. The man Jesus records lifts up his robes in the most ungainly way for, for a person of that age and that time, runs and sprints and throws his arms around his son, kisses his face and says, my son is home. Put a ring on his finger. Put a robe on him. He's not a slave anymore. He's back in the family. He is royalty. We are going to celebrate. He's lost and now he's found. You think you're a long way from God. You might think, how could he want anything to do with me? This is a story Jesus told. And it's about you and your heavenly father. God wants you to know the moment you give up and turn to him, things are going to be different. He wants you to know his, what his response will be. There is no guesswork because it's all about relationship and the restoration of that relationship. Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? We have a kind, tolerant, faithful, loving, compassionate, and patient God. And all of that leads and is working on us to just go on and make that step in conviction, to go and repent. So are you going to stick with worldly sorrow? Are you going to allow that to, to impact your heart and your life? Are we collectively going to allow that to impact our church's life? Paul says it leads to death. Or are we going to humbly and courageously seek out godly sorrow? that leads to repentance, to salvation, and yes, life. Are we going to seek for God to change our minds? And are we, therefore, going to respond by changing our actions, our behaviors, and our lives through 180 degrees? The famous preacher C.H. Spurgeon put it this way. If you want to put it up on the slide, Ezra, thank you. I'll read it for you. I trust that sorrowful penitence does still exist, though I've not heard much about it lately. People seem to jump into faith very quickly nowadays. I hope my old friend repentance is not dead. I'm desperately in love with repentance. It seems to be the twin sister of faith. I do not myself understand much about dry-eyed faith. I know that I came to Christ by the way of weeping, the way of the cross. When I came to Calvary by faith, it was with great weeping and supplication, confess confessing my transgressions and desiring to find salvation in Jesus and in Jesus alone. So there we go. It's not repaint and sin no more. But let's go for godly sorrow. Let's go for repentance. Let's go for salvation. And let's go for life both for you and for me and for us collectively. Let's have the courage to let God break our hearts with what breaks his. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for every single person here tonight who's heard those words. And I pray that they're not my words, but God's words. 
and that we individually and collectively are listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying to our heart. So Lord, let us be obedient to that which you're calling us to be and to do. Lord, help us to know where we stand with you. For those who are lost, for those who don't know you, I pray that you would draw them into a saving relationship tonight with you, Jesus. But for those of us who are and seek to be and claim to be followers of Christ, we come to be repentant before you. To humbly ask you, Lord, to break our hearts for the things that break yours. And we're willing, we might not like it, but we're willing to take radical, immediate action to literally turn 180 degrees from where we were going and change the direction of our lives to your higher things. And Lord, there are areas, some of those that might even not be known to us at this moment. But Lord, just simply break our hearts But Lord, there are some of us who are profoundly aware of some of those areas that are rebellious, that are sinful, that are destroying us and others. And we're living in worldly sorrow. And so Lord, we just cry out to you to help us stop it now. So we repent, Lord. We repent from all of those things. We turn to you. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. Change our mind. Change our behaviors. Lord, let us know and hear the good news once again. That while we may have sinned, while we have messed up, Jesus Christ died for us. As we've already sung in some of those songs, the blood of Jesus makes us clean. So we offer this dangerous prayer. Forgive us, save us, change our minds, transform our lives. May we know that we are a fully adopted child of God back into your family. The, those sins are forgiven. The slate is wiped clean. Amen. Shirley is going to come. Before we come and perhaps seal our repentance as we share bread and wine, we're going to come and sing that, that particular worship song with that line in it.